How's everybody doing today? You can remain standing as we read God's word. We are going to be in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Now on the very first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they sat, said to him, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remem yes, amen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified. And the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told these things to the eleven and all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying by himself themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself what had happened. Father, as we look at this passage, Lord, we want to hear from you. We could care less what man has to say, Lord. We care what you have to say. So, Father, just empty me of myself and may the words I say be yours. May you increase and I decrease. But, Lord, at the same time, give us ears to hear what your spirit would have to say to us. So, bless this time in your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The title of this message is The Hope of New Life. The Hope of New Life. And then a subtitle would be Dreams died, hope revived. Where do you go when you lose hope? When your dreams are shattered or when things don't work out the way that you think they should? Well, I hopefully you go for the Lord. Go to the Lord. The Bible says that in the heart, or anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. And we're going to share some of the good words, some of the best words. In fact, it says about the Bible, whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we, through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. And that's what these disciples are going to get. They're going to get words from God, and they're going to have their hope restored. I love what a pastor, Watchman Nee, said. Our old history ends with the cross. Our new history begins with the resurrection. And the story of the resurrection is all about renewing, reviving, and or giving hope. Our old history ends with the cross. Our new history ends with the resurrection. As we look here in chapter 24, if you remember, for those of you that were at our Good Friday service a couple days ago, everything was just horrific because the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, the Savior, was, was crucified on the cross. And we know he wasn't just crucified. He was basically tortured. He was beaten. But the Bible says, by his stripes we are healed, and his broken body was for our redemption. But they didn't get it then. All they saw was a dead Savior. And I was thinking about it. We all know that it was all the women that were at the tomb. There was one man at the, at the cross, and it was John. Remember Jesus said to John, and he looked at his mother, and he said, Behold your mother, and behold your son. And, he, and from that time, Mary was taken into the house of John. Well, John wasn't at the tomb. And I started thinking about that. Maybe he's like, oh my gosh, he's having me take care of his mom. He really is gone. He really is dead. Maybe he's not coming back. Well, this is where a lot of those disciples were. They were just like, what happened? We thought this was going to happen. And as we look through here, we find that the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty. And then there were a few angels. But it says that they were greatly perplexed. And the angels said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? That's a word for today. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Many of us look for life in places that are dead. Many of us look for vitality, for purpose, for meaning, for value in places that are not God's eyes. They're dead. Why are you going there? I think of the old country song, looking for love in all the wrong places. You know, many of us do that. We go to the places that God says, why are you looking for live the living among the dead? You know, the Bible says that we are to find everything that we need and have in our relationship with Jesus Christ. It tells us in John 15, Jesus says, I am the true vine and you are the branches. And he who abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit. What he's saying is, I am the true vine. You know what that says? There's a lot of other so-called vines out there. 
Things that promise to give you life, but they end up sucking the life out of you. They don't give you life. Jesus said, if you abide in me and ab I abide in you, as a branch abides in the branch, it will bear fruit. It will, it will produce. God has made us to be a blessing, to, to live a life of vitality. That's what the abundant life is. Jesus says, I've come to give you life and that more abundantly. He came to give us life eternal in a place called heaven, but he also gave us to give an abundant life here on earth as we walk in fellowship with God. And the Bible says God has put eternity into the hearts of men. But we have a tendency to try to fill that void and to go to all these other places that are not places that God wants us to be. You know, I picked that song uh, that they did there, and I, I like what it says. It says, hope was lost. And he says uh, that it was found in Jesus when he heard the words of Jesus. He found me on the road that leads to nowhere. I don't know about you guys, but he didn't just find me on the road that leads to, that leads to nowhere. He found me on the, load that, the road that leads to destruction. The Bible says, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many are there that find it. But narrow is the road that leads to eternal life, and very few find it. He says, strive to enter that narrow road. That's what we want to do. We want to be those people that enter the narrow road. Many of you have, but there's some of you here that have never done that. You've never actually given your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe like myself as a non-believer, you were looking for love in all the wrong places. You were looking for the living among the dead. Well, you're going to see what these disciples learn. Verse 6, he is not here but is risen. And someone said, praise the Lord. That's a good praise the Lord moment. He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Jesus talked about this repeatedly, but some reason they didn't get it. They didn't get it. And we're going to read in a few verses of what they were thinking and why they didn't get it. But the words, remember his words. And then in verse 13, we have these two, these two guys. They're disciples. They're not apostles, but they're disciples. And it says in verse 13, Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which, they happened, which happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that he, they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then one of those whose name was Cleopas said and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and the, our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. Then Jesus said, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe, in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So these two apostles, these two, I'm sorry, these two disciples, the first thing we do is they're going from Jerusalem to a town that's seven miles away. And a lot of times when we're disappointed or we're let down or we're hurt, we want to get away from that thing and worse, sometimes we want to get away from our remembrances of God, the things of God. That's the worst thing we can do. But Jesus is the shepherd who leaves the 99 sheep and goes after the one. So he goes after these two guys. He loves these two guys, just like he loves everybody here. Can I just stop and say, every person here, God loves you. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. God loves you immensely. Look at the nail prints in his hands. That cross back there. It just says that nails didn't hold Jesus to the cross, but love did. Love for you, love for me. No matter what you've done, God can forgive you. Some people think, well, you don't know what I've done, Pastor. He'd never forgive me. He will forgive anything. The Apostle Paul, the greatest Christian maybe ever, he was a murderer. He was a, 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 per, he was a persecutor of the church, and God saved him. And then God saved the thief on the cross. And God can do so many great things. But Jesus goes after these two sheep. 
And it says that in verse 15, while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. I love that. These two guys are just talking about everything that happened and Jesus just shows up right next to them. The Bible says that where two or three are gathered together in his name, Jesus is there in the midst of them. And then in the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, it says that God looked down and listened on them as they were talking about him. And he said he wrote them in his book of remembrance to those that talk about him and fear his name. There's a special book in heaven for those that just talk about the Lord. And they were a blessed people. But Jesus comes alongside them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And I love how he says, what kind of conversation is this that you have? Did you know God cares about what kind of conversations we have? You're like, ooh, I didn't want to hear that one. Well, if your conversation is good, it's okay. But God is always listening to us. He cares about us. He's watching us. He wants what's best for us. He's always working in our lives to, to make himself known. It says he was restrained. Well, the Lord is around you whether you know it or not. The Spirit of the Lord is around you. The Holy Spirit of God comes to bring conviction of sin and righteousness and judgment to the whole world. He's always trying to tell people how good God is, how they need God, how much he loves them, and how there is a devil that says he wants to steal, and he wants to kill, and he wants to destroy. That's biblical truth right there. But Jesus made himself known, and he says, while you walk another and while as you are sad, he knows that they were sad. Jesus knows when you're sad. He knows when you're glad. He knows when you're mad. He knows when you're bad. I could do a couple more rhymes, but he knows everything about you, and he cares about you. But he came to them when they were sad. And then I just love this one guy, Cleopas, says, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? Have you not known the things which happened there in these days? Everybody in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas knew what happened. Because at 12 o'clock noon... It got completely dark in the whole land. I mean dark for three hours. And that's when the, when the Son of God, Jesus, was hanging on the cross and the sin of the world came upon him. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. And then there was a mighty earthquake and the veil of the temple was torn. And it was just a crazy thing. Everybody knew what happened. And say, didn't you know about these things? And I love Jesus. What things? You think Jesus doesn't have a sense of humor? Like, what thing? Is it? Tell me. No, I have no, I have no idea. Just tell me. Jesus is so funny. I love what he goes to religious people, and he says, hey, when you start pointing out another person's sin, it's like looking at a speck in your eye when you got a big old log in your eye. He loves all these little funny things, and we'll see him show up to the disciples. He'll just show up in the room like, peace be with you. And like, where'd you come from? You know, it's kind of like, I think he's a funny guy. I think he's serious, but I think he's also funny. He's got a good sense of humor. But notice what he says, what things? He says, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. The first problem that they have with losing hope is in verse 19. Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, he went from Messiah, Lord, Savior, King, all of a sudden the prophet. Beware when you look at Jesus as just a teacher. Jesus isn't a teacher. He didn't come to be a teacher. He came to be a Savior. He came to be our Savior, and he came to be our Lord, and he came to be our Master and our King. These guys, guys they lost sight of that. And you know what? You're going to be sad, and you're going to be perplexed, and you're going to be bummed out, and you're going to be fearful, and you're going to be stressed out when you don't know the God the true God, and you don't look to the true God. Many people make God in their own image. They believe what they want to believe about God. But God says he's all-knowing, he's all-powerful, he's all-loving, he's slow to anger and abundant in mercy, full of compassion. I could go on and on, and they forgot about all that. But notice the second thing that they see here. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. They thought that he was going to be, the Messiah was going to be riding on a horse and just clearing house and take out the Romans because they were under tyranny from the Roman Empire. And Jesus didn't come to conquer the Romans. He came to conquer sin. He'll conquer all the evildoers when he comes back the second time. When he comes back the second time, it's totally victorious. He's victorious in another way right now is he has just given victory over sin and he gave a death blow to the devil. And now his main thing is to bring salvation to the world through the forgiveness of sins. They were hoping he would redeem Israel. 
But you know what? It's not about Israel. They were self-centered like many of us. It's about me. It's about me. Well, no, he wants to redeem the world. But you guys are, are going to be the chosen 12, which actually became 11. That's going to take this message and, and all the other disciples. You're going to take this message to the world. It's not about you. So their eyes were totally um, off the mark. And many times when we're disappointed, it's because our hope is in the wrong thing. There's a Bible verse in Proverbs that says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. When what you're hoping for doesn't happen, it makes your heart sick. Sometimes we hope for things that God doesn't want us to hope for. Or we hope for them in the wrong way. Or we hope for them in the wrong timing. But God wants us to trust him and put our hope in him. When we put our hope in God, he takes care of all the different things. The Bible tells us to delight ourselves in the Lord. He will give us the desires of, his, of our heart. The desires of our heart should be the desires of her heart, his heart, by the way. He tells us to trust good or trust in the Lord, do good and dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. He just wants us to walk with him and trust him and then watch how he shows up. And if the desire you have hasn't happened yet, but it's a good godly desire, it's going to happen. Believe it. That's what the resurrection is all about. It's, it's, it's new life and it's new hope in his promises. And then it says today is the third day. We just read in verse 7 where 6 and 7, remember how he spoke to you that he must rise on the third day? Jesus was always talking about the third day. One time he said, destroy this temple, talking about his body, and in three days I will raise it again from the dead. Another time some people were wanting Jesus to perform a miracle. He says, the only miracle I'm going to give to you is that Jonah was in the, the belly of the fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be on the, in the earth three days and three nights. He was always talking about the third day. And so there it's kind of comical that they're talking about the third day. But then it goes down in 22 and 24, telling that the women saw him, and they brought word back to the disciples, but they didn't really quite understand it or believe it. And look what he says in verse 25. O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe. O oh, foolish ones and slow to heart to believe. In the Bible, foolishness is really a person who doesn't believe God. In fact, it says it in um, Psalm 14. Psalm 14, 1 says, The fool is said in his heart, there is no God. It says he said it in his heart. He hasn't said it in his mind. He hasn't intellectually disproved God. In his heart, he said there's no God. And that's where our decisions come. And the Bible says many people don't come to the Lord because they are convicted of their conscience. The light, uh, the darkness does not like the light, so they stay away from light. In fact, the darkness hates the light. That's why many people don't want to come to church. They don't want to hear what the Bible has to say. They've made their mind up that there is no God. They may even say there is a God, but I'm not going to follow him. That's why the Bible is the most attacked book in the history of all creation. This book is so attacked because in it, Christians get power. They get faith to do great things. In it, it tells us the things that we need to change. It's been said many people don't read the Bible because there's fault in it, but because it finds fault in them. Think about that. They realize it calls them out on their sins. And God is not a cosmic killjoy wanting you to stop your fun. He knows what's best for you. Jesus said, I did not come to destroy men, but to save men. That's what he came for. And so he says, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe. You're acting like a non-believer. But then he does this. He says, ought not the son, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And then it says, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them on all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Now he's giving them a teaching from the Old Testament that is going to talk about all of the different times where Jesus is spoken of in the Old Testament. I can't help but think of um, Abraham. When Abraham had his son Isaac, and God told Isaac, Abraham, this is in Psalm 22, take your son, your only son whom you love, and go up on Mount Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice. Well, God didn't actually have him do that or want him to do that, but he was testing Abraham. And Abraham was obedient. He took his son Isaac. He tied him up like he was going to slay him. He pulled the knife back, and God said, okay, forget it. I wasn't going to do that at all. I was just testing you to see if you love me. That's a picture of Jesus. Abraham is the father. He took Jesus, our father, God the father took his son, his only son whom he loved, and he offered him on a sacrifice. But he didn't stop with the knife. He went to the cross. That's a picture of Jesus suffering for us on the cross that we might have eternal life. Another thing that they might have told him was the Passover celebration. 
the ladies just had a Passover celebration uh, on Wednesday, which was really good. I, I didn't go to it, but when I came in and I saw how it was fixed up, and then my wife gave me some lamb and some fruit and says, here, you could take this home. I go, oh, I'm going to get spiritual at home. I'm going to eat some lamb. So the next day I go, okay, I'm going to have some lamb. And I take one bite. And I go, you know, I should put some barbecue sauce on it. And then I said, that is absolute blasphemy. <laughs> I did not do it. I thought about it, but I didn't do it. It was actually really good, but I was just enjoying it. But this is what the story of the Passover. In the Old Testament, the children of Israel were in bondage. They were in slavery in Egypt. Like many of us were in our sin, we're in slavery. Egypt was a type of the world. Many of us don't realize it, but we have been slaves to sin. We've been doing our own thing until we come to know the Lord. But in the Old Testament, they were in slavery and bondage to, to Egypt. And so God had sent Moses, his prophet or his, his leader, to go to Pharaoh, the, the, the head of Egypt, and say, let my people go. And he wouldn't let him go. And he had 10 different plagues. And every time he would do a plague, they, he would try to get them to let his people go. But Pharaoh wouldn't. He kept hardening his heart. The last and 10th plague was the Passover. And he says, you're going to take a lamb. And he told this to the fathers. You're going to take a lamb, and you're going to bring it into your house for four days. At the end of the four days, you're going to take that lamb, and you're going to slay that lamb. And it's going to be a meal for you. But you're going to take the blood. You're going to put it on the doorpost of the, of the door, and you're going to put it on the lintel, just like a cross, the two nail-scarred hands and the crown. And when the angel of death comes over, any house that does not have a, the blood on the house is going to lose their firstborn. All the people that believed in God did exactly what he said, and they put the blood there, and, his, and he passed over. That's what Jesus has done for us. When the blood of Jesus' cross is in our, on our life, and we've accepted him as our Lord and Savior and accepted his sacrifice for us, the angel of death won't come at our house. This is a note to dads out there. It was the dad, the father, who was told to take that lamb. He was supposed to, to slay it. He was supposed to put the blood up there. And that's what we are as fathers. We're supposed to lead our kids to accept the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, which is Jesus Christ, because we don't want the angel of death to take them out. We want them to know God, and we want them to have eternal life. And there's so many other stories in the Old Testament. I think it just went over and over. You know, Psalm 118 talks about the chief uh, cornerstone, which was Jesus. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And the, the analogy is that all the religious leaders did not accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, but he was the chief cornerstone. And then it says in verse 28, as they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. I like how it says they drew near to the village where they were going and he indicated he would have gone farther. It's like they all go to the house and they're getting ready. All of a sudden Jesus started. They go, where are you going, Jesus? Just see, oh, no, come on, come on, have a meal with us. You know, sometimes Jesus wants us to ask to be a part of our life. He doesn't force his way. A very similar situation happened on the Sea of Galilee when Jesus told his disciples to go the other side. And a storm started turning up, and the tiny ship was tossed. And if not for the courage of the mill's crew, the mill would be lost. Well, long story, long story. But a storm came up, and they were freaking out. And Jesus just starts walking on the water. He starts walking, like, hey, guys, what's going on? And then he starts freaking out, help us. And he turns out, he says, be still, and he goes into the boat. Sometimes Jesus gets just close enough in our life that he wants us to ask him to come in. See, the Bible says if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. If you're wondering why, why isn't my relationship where it should be with the Lord? Are you drawing near to the Lord? Are you in his word every day? Are you praying? See, what Jesus is giving to the, um, he's giving them the word of God. He is the word of God. But he's also telling about the Old Testament passages. You know, when we first started our church and we started going through John and um, kind of crazy times then too, just like they are now. And the words of Jesus just jumped out. 
where he said in John 16, 33, he says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And Jesus was telling us, the words that I speak will give you peace. You will have peace by remembering and obeying the words that I give to you. But then he drew near to them, and he said, Abide with us, for the evening is far spent. Came to pass as he sat at the table that he took bread, blessed, and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. Isn't that crazy? He just breaks the bread, and it's Jesus. It was Jesus. It was like he just disappeared immediately. But look at the next verse. This is like one of the key passages to the whole study here today. And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? When did their heart burn? When he opened the scriptures to them. This is the word of God. And Jesus said, the words that I give you, they are spirit and they are life. You want to learn about God, everything is in here. You also learn about you. You learn about life. You learn about heaven. You learn about hell. You learn about prayer. You learn about how to resist temptation, how to be a good husband, a good father, how to be a good parent. Everything that we really know about godliness is found in this book. And God is just saying, man, if you will trust me on this. You know, one of my favorite passages is Psalm 1. In fact, we did a whole message on Psalm 1 early on when we had the church. Psalm 1 says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight, his joy is in the law of the Lord, the Bible. It says he meditates day and night. It says he will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. And, what, and he will not wither and whatever he does will prosper. I love that analogy as you're seeking the Lord. You're not getting the counsel from the world and from the things that aren't of the Lord. You're getting your counsel from the word of God and you're delighting in it. He says you're going to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You could be in a desert, but if there's a river flowing through there, that tree can thrive, and it can still bear fruit, and whatever you do will prosper. God wants to prosper and wants to bless us, and it's by digging into his word, because when you read the word of God, you're reading about God. I love the way the Bible is called the word of God, because when you read it, God has a word for you. He has a word for me. That's where we learn about God in here. And so what did they do with that knowledge? Once they knew it was Jesus, what did they do? Well, it says they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the 11 and those who were with them gathered together. They had to tell somebody. They were so fired up and excited that the risen Savior had come to them. They wanted to tell all their buddies about. They wanted to get that news out. And that's what we're supposed to do as Christians. We're supposed to take that news and try and get it out to other people. Because God doesn't want just Christians in heaven. He wants the whole world in heaven. But you can't get to heaven if you don't go through Jesus, the free gift of God who laid his life down for you. You have to accept that to get your sin forgiven. See, heaven isn't about, um, let me say this. Heaven's not for good people. It's for forgiven people. That's not what religion teaches. Religion teaches you have to work hard and you have to do certain things. If you reach this level, blah, 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 you can get to heaven. And if you're thinking of what I can do to get to heaven, like, okay, I'm not as bad as that guy, or I did all these good things, God says, that's not what gets you. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that has forgiven you of your sin. In fact, the Bible says in Galatians 2.21, if righteousness could, could come any other way than Christ died in vain. Think about that logically. Would you send your son to die to save somebody else if there was other ways that they could get saved? Uh-uh. And that's what Jesus knew. That's what God knew. There's only one way. Because it talks the sacrifice. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And that's why Jesus came. But then it says in verse 35, and he told them about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. How was he known to him? Some people think that, oh, I remember in communion, he broke it. And he said, this is my body. And he had the drink and, he, and the juice and was it his blood. Uh, I think I like to agree with what some of the other people have said. Many other Bible teachers and scholars that they saw the scars on his hand and they're like oh it's him you know they saw the scars on his hand it's been said when you get to heaven there's only going to be one thing man made and that's the scars in Jesus hands the nail prints and he's always going to be able to show everybody this is how much I loved you if you ever doubt if you ever wonder this is going to remind you I gave it all for you many of us talk about being all in nobody was all in like Jesus 
he gave his life. No greater love has no one than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. But you know what? He didn't just lay it down for his friends. Romans tells us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. While we were ungodly, while we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. The Bible says, scarcely, scarcely will one die for a righteous man, but Christ proved his love. He died for any of everybody, no matter what they did. And then in verse 36, as they said these things, Jesus stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace to you. I love that, peace to you. The Bible says, if you've been justified by faith, meaning if you in faith have accepted Christ, it says you have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. You want peace with God, it comes through Jesus. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace. Peace comes from, from God through his son, Jesus. And it says, but they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit or a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled? No, he didn't say that. He didn't act like a ghost. I'm sure he just said, why are you troubled? Why are you frightened? It's me. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. See that it's me. And, they, and then they still, have, they still struggle with believing a little bit. But it's interesting. They were terrified. They were frightened. They were troubled. And they had doubts in their hearts. That's what some people have. Uh, when they think about giving their life to the Lord. Wow, this is kind of frightening. I kind of got doubts in my heart. Well, you know what? That's what faith is. Faith is you got to believe who he is and what he said he is. But sometimes we as believers can have those things, those, those same emotions where we're not living in faith, where we're not believing. And Jesus is like, I'm giving you fruit, man. I'm showing you the hands that are scarred. And I love how he says, do you have any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. And Jesus loves to eat with his people. We talked about this on Good Friday. He says, I'm not going to drink of the fruit of this vine until we drink it new in the kingdom, and I drink it with you. Jesus said in, John, in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, invites me, and I will come in, and I will dine with him and he with me. Jesus wants to have fellowship with you. He doesn't want to just save your soul. He wants to have a relationship with you. In the book of um, Luke and also in the book of Matthew, it says that there's those, they, he uses the analogy of people knocking on a door and the master says, I do not, and they said, Lord, let us in. He says, I do not know you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And he closes the door. And he says, and it goes on to say that those who do the will of God are going to go to heaven. But he starts off by saying, I do not know you or where you are from. See, being a believer is knowing God, having a relationship with God. That's what Jesus said in John, John 10. He says, I am the good shepherd. He says, and I know my sheep, and they hear my voice, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and no one can snatch them out of their hands. He says, I know them. He wants a personal relationship with you. Yeah, he wants to save your soul. He wants to forgive you your sin. He wants to get you to heaven, but he wants to have a personal relationship with you while you're here on earth. It's a pretty amazing thing. And then we get to verse 44. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which must be fulfilled are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Now he's with the eleven. What he just told the two, he's going to tell the eleven. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. You know what? The things of God, if you're not a believer, you, you will understand some things, but you won't understand a lot. The Bible says a natural man can't discern the things of God. Like they're, they're like confusing. They're like a mystery. But when one turns to Christ, it's like the light goes on. The blinders are taken away. And they're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know this. Then they start reading the Bible and they start learning more about God. But that's another thing too. As believers, when we read the Bible, we should always be praying, Lord, speak to me. Open my eyes that I would see what you want me to hear. What do you want me to say to me? And have, a, have an attentive heart and listen to what the words of God are. Because Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, and, and it's also quoted in, in Luke, Jesus said, talked about two men. One hears the word of God and does it. One hears the word of God and doesn't do it. The one who hears the word of God and does it, he's like a wise man. He built his house on a rock, and the storms and the floods beat on the house and it stood firm because it was on the rock. Those who hear the word of God and they don't do it, they're like those, their house is built on the sand. And when the storms and the streams beat on the house, it fell, and great was its fall. What he's saying is if you are hearing the word and God doing it, you're anchored in the rock. 
If you're living your life without God, when the storms of life come, it's going to be like a, a house of cards. There's nothing to stand against it. God wants to be involved in our life. He wants us to follow him because he knows what's best for us. And he created us. But then he tells these people that, and then he basically gives them the gospel message. Verse 46. Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. Did you catch that? To all nations. This is what Jesus is trying to get a hold of his disciples. You guys need to get this because I'm sending you to all the nations. And he goes on to say in the next verse, and you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry or wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. He was reminding those disciples that after he ascends into heaven, you're going to go to Jerusalem, you're going to be in a prayer meeting, and the Holy Spirit's going to come on you, and it's going to empower you to serve me, to be a witness. And that power is still available. It says in Luke 11:13 that the Holy Spirit is given to those who ask him. If you're a believer, you ask the Holy Spirit to fill you, and he'll, he'll come to you. But that's the gospel message that Christ suffered and rose again the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. When Jesus came on this earth, the first thing he did was he said was repent and believe the gospel. Repent, meaning turn from your old selfish lifestyle and doing what you want and putting you first and start going towards God and, and see what he wants. God wants us to put him first, others second, and ourselves last. We do the exact opposite. We put us first, we put people second, and God's at the tail end. That's not how God created us. The abundant life that God has for us, the life of meaning, the life of purpose, is when you recognize you were created in God, not for you, but for him and for others to be a blessing. But that's the gospel message. Repent and believe and accept the gospel message. And I love how this ends up in verse 50. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. All of these disciples started off perplexed, sad, without hope, and by the time Jesus got done talking to them, they're worshiping, they have great joy, they're in the temple continually praising and blessing God. That's the, what the Lord wants to do in us. He wants to speak into our lives, and he wants us to have this blessed life. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up here as we close. But I want to share what's called the gospel message. I kind of alluded to it and said it more than a few times, but I'm going to be more specific. I believe God is calling people sitting right here to give their life to Jesus Christ. I also think there may be some of you that you used to walk with the Lord, but you're not with the Lord. God's calling you too. The Bible says multitude, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. The Holy Spirit loves every, each and every person here. The Holy Spirit, God himself, wants every human being to be forgiven of their sin and to go and spend eternity with him in heaven. But it comes through what Jesus did on the cross. What Jesus did on the cross. See, the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What does that mean? Every one of us have blown it. Every one has sinned. Every one has disobeyed God somewhere in our life. And the Bible says that sin separates you from God, that he can't even hear your prayers because of that. It's Isaiah 59, 2. He says, your sins have separated me from you, so I can't even hear you. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Death is separation from God. The wages of sin... When we work, whatever your profession or business is or your livelihood, when you work at the end of the week, the wages that you earned is paid for you. God is saying the fact that you're a sinner, the wages are death, eternal separation from God. But God, the second half of that verse says, but the free gift of eternal life is through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ offers the free gift of salvation, but it's a gift. A gift is something that needs to be received. God offers you that right now. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. With the heart, one believes unto righteousness, but with confession, one goes to salvation. I'm going to ask some of you to come up here if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ. You want to be a Christian. You're tired of that old life. 
You were on the road going to nowhere or going to destruction, and you must start following God. In a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to come up, and we're going to pray for you. There may be some of you that walk with the Lord at one time in your life, but you just like, you know what? That's me, Pastor. I've been doing my own thing for way too long. And you know what Jesus would say? So how's that been working for you? I've been praying for you. I've been praying for you. And Jesus would often call people openly and publicly. Jesus came to two fishermen, Peter and Andrew, and said, come follow me. And it says they dropped their nets and they followed him. Then he went to James and John, follow me. They left their father's business and they followed Jesus. Then he came to Matthew, a tax collector. Tax collectors were known for ripping off the people and allied with the Romans because they would collect money from their own people and give it to the Romans, and they were hated. He left his practice, forgot, said, the heck with the money, I'm going to follow Jesus. And the Bible says, if you confess me, just as Jesus speaking, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father in heaven. But if you would deny me before men, I will deny you for the Father in heaven. So as a worship team plays this, this song, I want you guys to come forward. And I want Christians to pray for everybody around you or someone that God's put on your heart. And if God's touching your heart, I want you to come forward. You got two voices going on inside your head right now. One is from the Lord. He says, you know, you need to do this. And there's another voice that says, oh man, what are people going to think? Or, oh, is this really true? But yeah, it's true. The devil does not want you to come to faith in Jesus. He does not want you to do this. But God wants you to, and he wants to bless you. So if you want your sin forgiven, if you want the hope of heaven, if you want to start following God or start coming to God, I'm going to ask you to come down these aisles and just stand right here, and we're going to pray for you. Come right now. said what will a man give in exchange for his soul is it worth it to get all the things the world has to offer no it's not your soul is the most precious thing Jesus also said you're either for me or you're against me there's no middle ground what are you talking about pastor I don't hate Jesus but do you love him are you serving him Jesus defines people in two categories he says you're either for me you're, or you're against me you're gathering people to me or you're scattering people away from me. You're living a lifestyle that's all about you and you're, just, you're pushing people away from the Lord or you're going to follow God and try to live for him. I'm not talking perfection. I'm just talking following Jesus and wanting to follow him and make a difference. If that's you, come forward. God is tugging on the hearts of some of you right now. You know you're having a battle. That's a battle everyone has gone for. And you got to decide, am I going to live by faith and follow what God says? Or am I going to go by my feelings and my emotions? Or what the world says or my friends say or other people say? When it's all said and done, it's going to be you and Jesus. Here's a question I have before, for you before we have the song play again. If you were to die today, I don't want to see that happen, but if you were to die today and Jesus were to say to you, why should I enter you? Why should I allow you to enter my heaven? What would you say? 
What would you say? If it's got anything to do with I or me or what I've done, that's not the right answer. It's Jesus. I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I accepted his blood over my life for my forgiveness. That's why it's the good news. You don't have to earn salvation. It's a free gift. You just have to believe it and receive it. If that's you, if you want to give your life to Christ, once again, if you want that guilt taken away, you want to follow the Lord, you're tired of the old life, running away from God, doing your own thing, come forward right now. And after the song, we're going to pray. And everybody else, keep praying. But if he's tugging on your heart, don't say no. Come up here and get prayed. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secure. He will my shield and portion me. As long as life endures, my chains are. soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine will be forever Anybody else as we pray for these with these two? Come over here, Dave. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Okay, gentlemen, I'm proud of you guys. It takes courage to do what you did. But you're honoring exactly what Jesus said. You confess me before men. He says, I will confess you before the angels of God and for the Father in heaven. That's a good thing. I'm just going to lead you in a simple prayer of giving your life to Christ. Basically, we're confessing that we're sinners, that we need God, that we believe he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins and he rose again from the dead. And then you're going to repent from your sins and you're going to follow him. Amen? Amen. Okay, just repeat after me. Dear Lord, Dear Lord thank you for Jesus. For him going to the cross and dying for my sins. I also believe he rose again from the dead. Forgive me, Lord. I'm sorry for the things I've done. But I accept your forgiveness. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I promise to turn from my sins and to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, In Jesus name. Amen. amen. All right, guys. Thank you. Hey, um, if you could follow Rick over there, I want to give you a free Bible, and they're going to talk and pray with you. And guys, as we're closing, maybe some of you are like, you know what, I wish I would have done that. Go over to Rick and these guys over at the table. They have Bibles there. There's two things that they have at that table. I just talked about what the Bible says about how to have a relationship with God. We got two free give giveaways. One is a little tract that says Steps to Peace with God. Basically says the things I say, but maybe says a little better. Very simple to look at. Read it on your own. 
And then we have Bibles. They have everything you need to know about God and the main uh, themes of the Bible. These are both free gifts to you. Don't trust what I said. This isn't a Pastor Marty thing. This is not an Impact Bible Fellowship thing. This is a Bible thing. So I want to, we want to give that free gift and offer it to you guys. But right now, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's stand up and worship. So what's the answer to that question? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? You guys got it. Hey, let me pray you out. Father, we thank you so much for what you did on this day 2,000 years ago. You rose from the dead, Lord. You gave us new life. You said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he will die, he may live. And we thank you for that. So bless everybody here. I pray that they have a great time with family and friends or wherever they're going. And Lord, just protect them, be with them, bless them, lead them and guide them. Help them to keep their eyes on you. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you guys.